All right, so continue on in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, it says there in verse 1, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came to his own city. And behold, they brought him to, uh, to him a sick man, a man sick of the palsy, lying in a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. So it's kind of interesting here. Of course, we know this is kind of a very familiar story. Uh, you know, elsewhere in Luke, where we're talk gives more detail about this story, where they actually pull out the thatch of the roof and they lower him down on the bed. And it's kind of a kind of an interesting story. It's really unique. But what's interesting is that you know, of course, we know this man ends up getting healed. We see that later on here in this passage. Is that before Jesus tells this man to rise and take up his bed and walk, he makes this statement here. He says, "Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee." And I think that's significant. That's something we should take a you know take note of is the fact that he's addressing this this young man's soul more than his body. Uh, when he when, of course I mean the young man definitely wanted to be able to to stand up and walk and, and, and like everybody else. But when Jesus sees their faith, he says to them, you know, thy, thy sins be forgiven thee. So what we can learn from this is that the soul is more important than the body. You know what our the condition of our soul, where we're going when we die. That's far more important than. You know how we're faring physically, and that's something that Jesus taught often. You know, and, the, and he says in Matthew uh, 16, you have to turn there. He said, "For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But what shall a man give in exchange for his soul?" So the soul is a very important thing. I mean, God knows the value of the soul. I think that's something that we can learn from this statement that He makes here when He when He addresses this young man concerning his soul. And really, when we think about different examples throughout Scripture, you know, it's this understanding, knowing and understanding that the soul is what matters more than our physical body. You know, that that's something that Job understands. You know, Job in the Old Testament, he understood that, and that's really what made him exceptional in the sight of God. Uh, it says there, uh, you know, Job, Job said in thir uh, Job thirteen, "Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him." He said, you know, even though he slays me, I'm still going to serve God. And of course, we know the affliction that Job went through, all the suffering and the trials physically, you know, not only with the death of his family, not only with you know, the loss of his income and his wealth, but also down to his own flesh. I mean, he suffered greatly. But he understood something. He understood that it was well with his soul, that when he was tried, he would come forth as gold. He knew that his soul was in a good, in a good state. And you know, so Job understood it. Jesus obviously is teaching it, and Job understood it. But even more than that, the devil understands this fact too. If you call, it was the devil that was the one that afflicted Job. That he got permission from the Lord to go and to, uh, you know, afflict his, you know, kill his family and to do all these things and put him through all these trials. And one of the last things he did is he afflicted Job's soul. And it says there, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. He's saying he knows something about human nature. See, the devil studies us. He knows us. He's been around a long time. He knows how people work. Yeah. And he knows that everybody seems to have a limit. You know, he knows where our limits are and how far you can push a person if he's able to. And he knows that a man, uh, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And that's a very true statement. You know, people are always trying to go to great lengths to extend their life and, and take care of themselves and eat all the right things. You know, we want to live as long as we can. And if they, the devil goes on and says, but put, put forth uh, thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. And he will curse thee to thy face. You know, he's saying, look, you know, there's a limit to what people can take. And he's saying, if you could touch his flesh, he would curse you to his face. But of course, that's not what Job did. We know that Job, you know, did come out as gold. That he yep. did, you know, maintain his integrity and set, spoke that which was right. And that's why he's, you know, lifted up, you know, and God praised him for that. So Job understood this fact. The devil understands this fact. And of course, Jesus, the one who's teaching this, understands it. Better than anybody. If we recall, you know, we talked about uh, a few weeks ago about, you know, uh, the great lengths that, you know, we should be willing to go to if, if it would help us at all to not go to hell. You know, we know, of course, the one thing we can't do, the one thing we must do to not go to hell is just believe, right? right. If we just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be saved. But Jesus said, you know, if it were possible, he was speaking kind of hypothetically, but he was talking about, you know, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, or it's better thee to enter into life maimed than to having two hands to go into hell. Where the into the fire that shall never be quenched, and where the worm dieth not. So he was even saying, you know, your body is not as important as your soul. Of course, he's not advocating that we go and maim ourselves in order to go in the, go in the kingdom. He was just making the point there that it would be better for you 
to, to cut off a part of your body than go to hell. Because we, he understood that the soul is more important than the body. And that's something that we always have to keep in mind. Now, in verse 2, he says there, And behold, they brought unto him a man sick of the palsy, lying in a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. So he says, so why, you know, he kind of, then in verse 6, he goes on and explains why he said that. Why it is that he said that and, 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 and made that first statement about his sins being forgiven him. And it says there in verse 3, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on the earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed and go into thine house. So, of course, they say, yeah, that's why he said it was for their sakes. You know, he says this for their sakes. That's why it says right there that ye may know that he has the power to forgive <laughs> sins. And if you would, turn over to Mark chapter 2. Keep something there, but turn over to Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> now, they said there, that, now, it says there that uh, they, and with bold certain the scribes had, had said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. They're saying this guy's you know, committing blasphemy. Now what they mean by that is explained in, in a parallel passages here when it says in Mark chapter 2, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were sin, certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Now this is what they said is the blasphemy. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now that's a good question, but this really should have been like an aha moment for the Jews. I mean, they kind of should have they kind of answered their own question there. Right. That should have been a, a you know a clue to them, like, hey, only God can forgive sins. <laughs> Duh. You know, so it's like yeah. so obviously the guy, this guy, Jesus, is God. Amen. And that really should have snapped them out of it. But what was their response? They said, No, this is blasphemy. This guy's committing blasphemy. It goes on and says there in Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 7, And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Verse 9, it says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and, and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, Many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But Jesus, but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, of course, that last bit that last bit of this passage here, where he says, They that are whole be not a physician, but they that are sick, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. That is a proof text that's often used by the repent or perish crowd, or those that would say you have to repent of your sins to be saved, or that you have to be willing to give up your sins. This is often a passage that they'll turn to and say, Well, Jesus said that you know that he he called sinners to repentance. And if you would, I should say to Mark, but turn back to Mark chapter 4. You know, and I've talked about this at length, and I won't go off too long because there's a lot more in this passage about this. But, you know, every time I see this bucket, I just want to spit in it. So we got to kind of take a minute here and just kind of deal with this. He says there, you know, so they'll use this text and say, hey, Jesus preached repentance. And we agree with that. No one of them, we're not saying he didn't preach repentance. We're just saying you don't have to repent of your sins to be saved. That's, right. That's the colossal difference, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they'll use this as a proof text. And really, when we look at this, it's verses 12 and 13 are a very poor proof text for this crowd, for these people that want to promote this false doctrine. You know, first you have to consider the fact that Jesus is addressing, when he makes this statement, unbelieving Jews. I mean, the same guys that are saying he blasphemed it. You know, these same guys that aren't making the connection that only God can, you know, can uh, forgive sins. And there's Jesus doing it. So, that's who he's speaking to. So, I don't know that you want to base your doctrine when Jesus is, you know, rebuking another, uh, you know, these false prophets. It says there in Mark chapter 4, if you're there in Mark chapter 4, look at verse 11. And he said unto them, 
Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So another thing we have to consider is the fact that he's actually speaking in a parable here. And when he speaks to them in parables, it's for a very specific reason. It's so that they may not perceive, that they may not hear, that they may not understand, that they should be converted, and that their sins should be forgiven them. I mean, Jesus often uses very cryptic and very dark sayings when he's speaking to the Jews. He's trying to be mysterious. He's trying to, you know, leave them wondering because they don't, they're, they're, they cannot be saved. And uh, because they've, they've rejected him. You know? And we'll see later where they actually blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Right. So Jesus is being very cryptic here in Matthew on purpose, where he's saying, you know, it, and, and of course we can understand it, you know, it's not that, it's not uh, the darkest of sayings, but it is him answering in a cryptic, met, in a cryptic way. So misrepresenting this passage also is, can actually create contradictions in Scripture. I mean, that's, that's usually the, the, root of the, the, the way to attack the root of this false doctrine is just to say, well, if you're going to tell me it's repenting your sins, then you, have to, you know, then you have to try and synthesize all these other verses in the Bible that say it's all by faith, that it's not of works, and that say that you know, turning from sins is work, Jonah 3.10, yep. and all these other verses. So when you say, when you misrepresent this, pers or this, uh, this verse, you pull this out of context, and, and you use it that way, you've created a big contradiction within the Scripture. So that's a really poor proof text to turn to to try and prove this doctrine. Another, another thing you have to consider is the fact that, you know, everyone, well, what is Jesus saying? Well, everyone does need a physician in the spiritual sense. And he said, he did say, I came out to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Now, that would include everybody. Yep. You know, that would include everybody. Every single sinner needs to come to repentance. That's who he's calling. That's who Jesus died for was for, was for everybody. So they unintentionally put, but these people that would say, you know, well, he's saying you have to repent of your sins, they're kind of unintentionally putting them in that righteous crowd. They're kind of saying, well, we're, we're the, you know, what Jesus would say, the righteous there. Saying, I came not to call the righteous, you know, well, that's us because we've already repented. There's no, we don't need this, this spiritual physician. They kind of, they don't, whether they realize it or not, they've kind of put themselves over there by saying, hey, you know, we've, we've repented of our sins and that's how we get saved. They don't need a savior because they've repented of their sin. I mean, a thought I, I was I was you know reading this and writing the sermon and just the thought of that song "Victory in Jesus." Who's ever heard "Victory in Jesus"? You know, we won't sing that one here. You know, because in that song it says, "Then I repented of my sin and won the victory." You know, it promotes that false doctrine. So, and when I was thinking about that song, you have to really think about those words and what people are saying that you know that they're righteous because they repented of their sins. They're saying, "Then I." repented of my sins yeah. and won the victory. They're making it about them. They're making it about what they did, yeah. about their works, about how they quit doing this sin or quit doing that sin and turned their life around and got right with God. And it was about what they did. It's all in that, that one line in that song. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I've seen people, they try to kind of like change the words of that song and say, well, it's such a great song. And, you know, I don't know if, it, if you know, if, if, if the line, if the, if the, uh, I don't know how you would say it music, but if that one chorus is, is unclean, then the whole song is unclean, in my opinion. So we shouldn't even sing any of it. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's the thing, though, is in Romans chapter 3, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. Amen. They are, are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Yep. So when Jesus said, I came to call the sinners unto, uh, not, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, that includes everybody. You know, he's not trying to separate two different crowds and say, well, there's people that are really bad and need to just get their life right and become righteous and repent of their sins. No, there's no one. There's none righteous. There's not one. Yeah. So <clears throat> we'll keep continue moving on. Like I said, I don't want to spend a whole sermon on that, but we do have to kind of touch on that point when you come across it because that is a text that they often like to turn to. Now it says there in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14, Then came, he to, uh, then came to him the disciples of John, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy, thy, thy disciples fast not? And Jesus say, said unto them, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But well, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, 
For that which is put uh, is put in to fill fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But the new wine, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now I don't have a lot to say on this passage other than this that. These verses are a really good example, at least to me, about not looking too deep, or at least deeper than is needed to understand something. I used to read that, that bit there about the new cloth and the old cloth and the rent and the old wine, and I'm like, what is he saying? What does this mean? This is such a deep thing. And I've heard, I'd ask people about it, and I'd get different explanations, and other people have preached things about it. And, you know, maybe there is, like, a real deep meaning to this, that, you know, a lot of different applications that can be made. But I think the surface thing that, I mean, it's pretty, it's just right there on top that we can, we can understand is that it doesn't make any sense to fast when there's no reason to. Right. You know, it wouldn't make any sense to put new wine in old bottles if they're going to burst. Right. I mean, if you knew that, you know, why would you do it? Amen. Or if you knew if I put this old cloth or new cloth into an old garment that it's going to be worse, well, then don't do that. You know, it's, it's that simple. Mm. So that's kind of saying, it's just, he's just saying it's, not sense, it's nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense for them to fast while the bridegroom is with them. Amen. <laughs> he does say, though, that then shall they fast, meaning when after he is gone, when he's taken from them, you know, that then shall they fast. So the other point I kind of want to make here is that it says, then shall they fast. It does not mean they must fast. You know, a lot of people will say you must fast. You know, I don't, I don't know that it's something you absolutely must do. Like, if you never fast, then you're in some kind of sin. Mm -hmm. Like, you're commanded that you must fast. It just says that they shall fast. You see, Jesus knew that people would fast. He knew it was going to happen. He said the days will come when they shall fast. So he didn't even have to command it. He already knew that it would happen. That, when, that, that one day after he had gone, when it would make sense to fast, that that was when they were going to fast. He didn't say you have to fast, you must fast, you're in sin if you don't fast. Because here's the thing about fasting, you know, fasting is a very private matter. It's something that's been... You know, we talked about that earlier, a few weeks ago, about... There are certain things that we should do in secret, you know, giving our alms in secret, praying in secret. And fasting was one of those things, too. You know, we should, we should fast in secret. We shouldn't look like we fast. That we should wash our face and anoint our, our heads with oil and not appear unto men to fast. So fasting is a real private matter. That, you know, and I don't think that's, it's something that, uh, you know, you have to, it's something you must do. I think if we're walking with the Lord and we desire to know God, that it's something that will probably just come up naturally. You know, something that will probably, you know, something will go on in our life. There might be some prayer that we want answered, or we have some burden, and we just want some way to afflict our souls, or show God that we're serious about something, that we're, we're intent on, you know, doing something, or whatever it might be. It's just a way for you to express to God, you know, some, some you know, contrition, or just, you know, desire of your heart that, that you're, you're trying to be serious with God. And if a person, as they grow in Christ, and as they, understand more about the things of God, I think that's something that just might come up naturally. And that's why God doesn't have to command you to fast. And then, you know, we could preach a whole sermon on fasting about all the different types of fasts there are. You know, there's, we see many different fasts in the Bible about you, know, you could fast, you could just skip one meal. You know, or you could go a day or three days. Or if you really want to go for that 40 day or, you know, good luck. <laughs> you know. I've obviously never done that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that, and I don't recommend that. That's incredibly dangerous. And I've met people that have done it, and they've had serious uh, health uh, side effects. I mean, that's something that you should take very seriously and, and not do flippantly. But the point I'm trying to make is that we shouldn't be, you know, feel like we have to fast and make sure that everybody else is fasting. You know, that we shouldn't uh, insist upon it, you know, or try to overemphasize it. You know, because when people are, you know, when they're insisting upon it or they overemphasize it, or they're letting you know other people know about their about their fast. Really, what they're doing is they're singing their own praise. Yep. Right. You know, they're kind of let you know in kind of like a kind of a backdoor way, kind of you know like letting you, that you know that they fast oft. You know that. So we need to be careful. It's a very private matter. And again, I don't think it's something that you have to do. It's something that will probably just happen naturally. But anyway, moving on in the sermon, we're gonna look at verse 18 there. <clears throat> It says in verse 18, While he yet spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thine hand on her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. 
And behold, a woman which was diseased, diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I might but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good cheer, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. So this is always, this is a kind of a very interesting passage. And there's a, another parallel passage over in Luke 8, if you turn over to Luke 8, that gives us a little bit more detail about the story and allows us to make a few more applications here. So in Luke 8, we learn a little bit more here about who this certain ruler was, a little bit more about the daughter as well. It says there in Luke chapter 8, verse 41, and behold, there came a man named Jairus. So that was the certain ruler. And it wasn't, it says, you know, in Matthew it says there was a certain ruler. Then tells us also that he was a ruler of the synagogue. So, of course, you have to remember that the synagogue and the Jews are at odds with Jesus Christ. So I mean, we preached, you know, I preached a sermon a little bit back about, um, you know, Sosthenes, you know, who was a ruler in the synagogue, who, you know, was somebody who got saved and, and Crispus, you remember that sermon about the two rulers of the synagogue in the book of Acts? And how it was kind of a big deal for a ruler in the synagogue to believe on Christ. You know, it was said that if any man should believe on believe on Christ, that they were to be put out of the synagogue. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a big deal that this Jairus, this ruler of the synagogue, is coming to Jesus. And it says there in Luke 8, 41, And he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet, and besought him that he would come into his house. So he's not coming to him privately, you know. He's coming to him, and to the point where he's he's down at his feet and he's begging him. It says, you know, he besought him to come into his house, for he had only he had only uh, one, for he had one only daughter, about the tw uh, about twelve years of age. Now we learn the age of this one daughter. We learn more that it was his only daughter. You know, so she's very dear and precious unto him, I'm sure, and that she was about twelve years of age. And she lay a dying. So this is a very serious situation, you know. That it, uh, this man is probably, you know, in a uh, just very distraught, you know, emotionally, and just very, you know, uh, upset. But as he as he went, the uh, the people thronged him, and it says there, uh, and a woman having uh, an age, an issue of blood, twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could heal, could be healed of any. So. The first thing we need to understand here is that is that God allows suffering to bring others to Himself. You know, often sometimes we go through some hardship, some physical ailment, some some difficult situation in our life, whatever it might be. Maybe even as severe as watching a loved one like this, you know, suffer to the point of death. I mean, that's that's a big deal. You know, if anyone's ever experienced that, you know that that's that's a really uh, traumatic thing to watch somebody go through that. And we would say, you know, well, why does God do that? Why does God just allow these things to happen? Why did God allow Jairus' one daughter at 12 years of age, you know, slip, you know, slip into, into death? Why did, why did he let her die? Well, I think it was to bring him to himself. You know, yeah. God allows these things to bring us closer to him often. You know, I'm not saying every time this happens that it's God, you know, trying to, you know, work in your life. Some, you know, nature takes its course sometimes as well, you know. It, we all grow old, we all, our bodies, you know, diminish and eventually we die. But a lot of times, especially when it's something is, I mean, what good reason is there for a 12-year-old girl to just be at the point of death? You know, she should be healthy and, 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 and doing well. Well, it was probably good to bring this man Jairus closer to himself. You see, first of all, as I mentioned, that Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. You know, a group of people that were very at odds with, 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 with Jesus. Well, we saw also that this this girl, her his daughter's death is what brought him to Jesus' feet. It's what brought him to leave where he was and to go in. Because again, remember, there's a crowd here. There's, he's being thronged, right? There's, he's in this house. He's doing these miracles. Everyone, you know, these people probably know who Jairus is. So he's going out in public and he's allowing himself, you know, to be even taken out of the position as a ruler of the synagogue. Probably came with a lot of prestige and payment. You know, he's probably taken care of and all that. And he's being... You know, publicly just throwing himself at the feet of Jesus Christ. Why? Because his daughter is brought to this to, to the place where she's dying or dead. So we see all first of all that God allows suffering, you know, to, to come into our lives to bring us closer to Him. You know, uh, David said, you know, it is good that I have been afflicted, you know, that I might keep Thy statutes. 
know, right. sometimes affliction is a good thing. Amen. You know, we need to keep that in mind when we go through a difficult time in our life that it might be God allowing that to happen so that we might draw closer to Him. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I like about this story is that we can learn that God doesn't move at the pace we want Him to sometimes, but at the pace He deems appropriate. So <laughs> you see in the story where Jesus, you know, He gets up to go, right? He's getting, getting ready to go. But then what happens? The people throng him. You know, they're slowing him down. I mean, can you just imagine being Jairus in the situation? Yeah. You know, you've got finally, you've, you've gone through all the, you know, you, you put yourself out there. You know, your daughter's dying, even, you know, dead, and, and she's and she's back at home, and Jesus is coming, and and and, and now all these people are slowing him down. Now now this this crowd is throwing him. I can, you know, imagine how frustrating it is when we're trying to get somewhere just in, in traffic. You know, we're just trying to get to the grocery store. We're just trying to get to work. We're just yep. trying to get to church or whatever it is. And we're like, Ugh. Yep. I mean, imagine the frustration Jairus would have had saying, there's this one man that can heal my daughter and everyone's slowing him down. Yep. Everyone's getting in the way. Hmm. And God, you know, Jesus here, it doesn't just, you know, split the, the sea of people. And make a clear path. <laughs> he allows it to happen. He allows himself to be thronged. He allows himself to be slowed down. So we have to understand that sometimes we want God to move, and He is moving, but we have to be patient and let Him move at His pace for whatever reason He sees fit. You know, I don't think Ajaris appreciated the throng or, that, or the diseased woman that comes and touches the hem of His garment. You know, first it's this, it's this and then... You know, this lady shows up and, is, and, is, and he, Jesus has got to stop and turn and have this conversation. And Jairus is just, you know, come on, you know, let's get it over with. You know, he can talk to you later. You know, this, my daughter's at home dying. Yeah. So we have to understand, first of all, you know, God allows suffering to come into our lives that he might bring us closer. And then when God is moving on our behalf, we have to sometimes, it might not seem like he's getting there. It might not seem like... You know, he's, 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 uh, he cares or is moving, or, but maybe he's just not moving at the pace you would like to see him. You know, I think a lot of times with our, with our lost loved ones, you know, we want him to get saved yesterday. We yeah. want him saved right now. Yeah. But sometimes that takes, you know, that takes years sometimes. You know, I mm -hmm. preached that sermon a while back about hard cases, about being willing to just be bear patiently with somebody and, and pray and, and witness and wait and let God begin to do a work. But the last thing I want to point out about this passage is that somebody always has it worse. Somebody always has it worse. You know, it's interesting here that the woman was uh, diseased for 12 years and the girl that died was 12 years of age. Mm. You know, I don't know what all the significance is, but I think one application we can get out of this is that, you know, the daughter had probably 12 good years in all likelihood. This was probably something that just came upon her very suddenly. You know, I, at least that's how I've always kind of read the scripture here and, and thought that it always struck me that way that she just was a very traumatic event. You know, so she has 12 good years, you know, and yeah, it's unfortunate that she's dying and it's, it's a tragedy and all that, but at least she had those, those years that she did. I mean, imagine the, the being diseased for those 12 years. You know, or, I mean, some people can even get to the point, you know, if we've ever had to go through the experience of seeing a disease affect someone we know and love, I mean, if it goes on long enough and it doesn't get better, those people are brought to the place where they really would rather just die, yeah. where they're ready to just go. You know, they're ready to just to let the disease take over and, and, and to die. They would prefer that to living. So you say, well, which is, which is worse? I don't know. But we, you know, what we can learn here is that somebody always has it worse. Yeah, it's a tragedy that this, this, young, this young girl is dying, his only daughter. But, you know, somebody's probably got it worse than that. You know, and whatever we're going through in life and we think, you know, this, this possibly couldn't be any worse. You know, it's kind of been a joke. That's the theme for, for 2019 so far. It, it could always be worse. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> something goes wrong. And it's like, well, it could be worse. You know, oh, it could be worse. But that is the truth. You know, we kind of joke about it. But that is a truth that we have to understand, that life does go on and that it, it could really be worse. No matter how bad we think we have it, um, it could be worse. I mean, you consider the fact, what has said, you know, the, yeah, the daughter died, but Jesus said there in, in Luke 8, verse 52, he said that she sleepeth. You know, she didn't, that's a, that's a, a, a reference to somebody being in heaven. You know, maybe she was so, still she's young enough in her mind and conscience that she hadn't reached that age of being accountable. I don't, 12 is pretty late, in my opinion, but maybe, maybe she'd heard the preaching of Jesus, or maybe she had believed on God. You know, maybe she, she was definitely saved. You know, he uses that, it refers to her in that manner. Yeah. 
and saying that she sleepeth. You know, so yeah, she died, but if she's in heaven, you know, she's way better off than that lady that's suffering here for 12 years. <clears throat> you know, that lady that was <clears throat> diseased, she probably, she would probably, if God was getting to the point where she'd prefer to die. You know, so we have to remember that somebody has always got it worse than us. We'll go ahead and move along here. Let's go back to Matthew chapter uh, 9 there. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to start back up in verse uh, 23. Verse 23, it says, And when Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. <clears throat> and he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed into scorn, but the people were put forth. He went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose, and the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then he touched, then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See, uh, see that no man know it. But they were departed. Uh, but when they were departed, they spread his uh, fame in all that country. And that's kind of an interesting story too. Here it says there in verse twenty-seven, two blind men followed him. You know, we just read over that. You know, why don't you go home and try to follow somebody with a blindfold on? Yeah. You know, just to the other end of the house. Yeah. Say, honey, I'm going to follow you around the house with this blindfold on. You know, and maybe they'll say nothing's changed. I don't know. But I mean, try to make it to the end of your driveway with a blindfold on. You know, they're trying to catch up with Jesus. It doesn't sound like he even pauses. It doesn't even sound like he even stops and acknowledges them. He just keeps right on going. You know, that probably wasn't easy for them. You know, and, and the whole time, and you think, well, maybe Jesus didn't know he's there. It says, no, they were crying as they went. You know, meaning they were yelling out. You know, so surely Jesus had to knew that they were there and what, he, what they wanted. I mean, Jesus definitely knew that these guys were there. And it says in verse 28, when he was come into the house, the blind men came unto him. So Jesus finally goes to where he's going, and they have to catch up. These two blind guys are following him, trying to catch up to where Jesus is. You know, and, and I think what this is showing us is that sometimes, you know, God's going to make us go further to get what we want. You know, if there's something we desire and want from God, sometimes we might just have to go a little further than we might expect. God might say, okay, well, you know, I'm glad you want that. You know, God wants to help you and bless you in that area. But maybe he's going to try and bring you along to where he is. He's going to try and lead you and to see how far you're really willing to go to get what you want. Uh, you know, there's this there's this cheesy thing that I read uh, earlier. It says, "To get what you uh, have never had, you must do what you have never done," and that is cheesy, right? But that is the truth, right? That's kind of this gets me. Is that a Jack Hiles quote? Really? Okay. Well, it's not so cheesy then. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's the truth, though, isn't it? It's kind of the, what's being illustrated here. You know, if you if you really want something bad enough, you know, I'm sure these blind guys weren't in the habit of following people around in their house. Yeah. You know, they're probably pretty stationary. They probably learn their immediate area, try to just get familiar with that so they can kind of, you know, stay safe and do what they needed to do. But that then they realize, hey, here's an opportunity to get something that we really want, and they were willing to do what they have never done, which is, you know, go that distance. You know, and that's really a principle that applies to many areas of our life. I mean, if you you could apply that to, to any of your area of your life, in your job, in your marriage, in your child rearing, you know, in your spiritual life, you know, if you want more than what you have right now, in all likelihood, you're going to have to be. You're going to have to do more than you've ever done in order to get it. So that was kind of an interesting uh, point that I, I saw there. But moving on, we'll keep. We'll continue on and try to wrap this up here. In verse 32, it says, "As they went out, behold, they brought him a dumb spirit possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the, uh, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marvelled, saying, it is not. It has, was never so seen in Israel.'" But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. So right here, this is uh, this is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You know, right. Sometimes people right. get confused about this and they think, you know, have I blasphemed the Holy Ghost? Or you know, I, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll people will kind of make a mockery out of this and, and and try to say they've done this. But this is a very specific thing, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into it. But in Mark uh, 3, if you want to read that on your own, Mark 3.22, it goes into that in more detail. And basically what it boils down to is that 
When blaspheming the Holy Ghost is when you are attributing the works of Christ to the devil. When you're saying that God did something through the power of Satan. You know, because then you're not giving God the glory for what's being done. What you're actually doing is you're giving glory, you know, to his to the enemy, to the to God's, uh, you know, uh, you're not giving it the, the glory to whom it belongs. You know, and the Jews, you know, we could go on on this because they really stuck to their guns on this. It wasn't like they went, oh, we didn't realize that was blasphemy Holy Ghost. We better knock that off. No, they went on to write. If you go on and just go on a Google search and write, you know, Jesus search Jesus sorcerer Talmud. Yeah. And just read all the things that they said in their yeah. Jewish writings about how he was a sorcerer, that he learned dark arts in Egypt, yeah. and that he was a conjurer and a deceiver. I mean, they stuck to their guns on this. They didn't get it right, you know. And they they've gone and they've gone on believing that, and they've committed uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And, the, and you know, the Bible says, "He that blasphemes of the Holy Ghost uh, against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation." So that's a pretty serious sin. But, you know, I think people need to understand exactly what it is so they don't start fretting and worrying about whether or not they've done that. You know, oftentimes you'll run into somebody and say, man, I, I think I might have done that. Is it too late for me? You know, the fact that you're even worried about it tells me that, you know, tells me that you, know, you are saved. You know, that, that you would be even so sensitive to think that maybe you might have done that in some, you know, backwards way or just some roundabout way that you, you somehow blasting the Holy Ghost, you know, on, on, unintentionally. Just the fact that you're even thinking along those lines and you're sensitive to that tells me that, uh, that you haven't. So but we'll move on here. Uh, just a few more points. It says there in verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So what we see here is Jesus' model of evangelism. This is a really good model that Jesus gives us of evangelism. First of all, I want us to point out in verse 35, it says that Jesus went. Jesus did not stand there and wait for them to come to him. Jesus went about all the cities and villages. That's what soul winning is. That's what uh, you know, evangelism is. It's to be done outside the church walls. We go out into the community. We go where they are and bring them the gospel. This whole thing about bring everybody to the church and then get them saved is unbiblical. Amen. You don't, you know, we could go on and on about this. Again, so many of these points could just be whole sermons in and of themselves. But you, we see a very good example, and in other places where Jesus goes to them, Jesus went. Soul winning takes place outside the church. You know, another thing I want to point out is he went about all the cities and villages. You know, he had a big vision. He was trying to reach the entire region. Right? Amen. He was trying to reach the whole city. Every city, in every place. And that's the vision we should have. You know, we're here to try and reach the entire city of Tucson. You know, we're going to try and reach the entire city within the city limits. And then once we've done that, we're going to go outside the city limits. And Faith Lord Baptist Church as a whole, you know, wants to knock every door in the state of Arizona. And knock every door on every Indian reservation. That's the kind of vision that we have to have as soul winners. Because that's what Jesus Amen. said. It says that he went into all the cities and villages. Not some of them. Yeah. Not just... You know, like some of these churches that they're only going to knock in their zip code. Yeah. You know, they're only going to knock in a certain square mile area, you know, radius. Or they're going to in a certain square, you know, radius out from their church. A certain square mile area. We're only going to go so far. Well, that's not the example we see from Jesus Christ. He was willing to go to all the cities, all the villages. You know, another thing he says there is that he saw the multitudes. And that's why he went everywhere, right? Because he saw the multitudes, all of the people. That's who he wanted to get saved. Not just a few people. Not just the people that he came into contact with as he went about his life and lived his life. You see, that's where this lifestyle evangelism falls short. This whole thing about, you know, just win people as you go. And I've heard people, and I'm saying Baptist people, I'm saying saved people tell me that when Jesus said go, it meant as you go, as you live your life, you know, reach out to people. You know, that's a bunch of hogwash. That, that, that's not, that's not ex at all, what, that's not the example that we see here. And lifestyle evangelism, you know, is my, maybe it's a nice kind of little, you know, uh, you know, supplement. You know, it's something that you could say, hey, obviously, it's some, if you're a soul winner who's, who's going to go out and reach everybody, obviously you're going to reach the people around you. Obviously you're going to still be burdened for the people in your immediate sphere of influence. But we see this model of evangelism that Jesus went, that he went to everybody, that he went to the multitudes, 
And why, what, why is that? Why is it that Jesus went? Was it just because it was something he had to do? Was it just because it was something that if he didn't do, people would look down on him or not think as highly of him? No, it says there because he was moved with compassion. Yeah. You know, and that's how we're going to accomplish this goal. And that's what's going to keep us as uh, being faithful, dedicated soul winners, day in, day out, year in, year out, going out and reaching the multitudes, is if we have compassion. When we see the multitudes and we look at them and we are moved with compassion, as Jesus was. Compassion is what's going to compel us to go out and reach every city and every place. <clears throat> And why is it that he had compassion on them? It says there, because they fainted. You know, that's what he saw. When he looked out, he saw people fainting in the way. And really, if we were to look out in our, you know, in our uh, city and in our surroundings and in our communities, that's what we would see. You know, we were out soul winning here this last week, and we were in a neighborhood, and, and a couple of us said that was some of the weirdest soul winning we've ever done. And truly it was. There were some odd folks out there, right? But you know what? There was a lot of people that were fainting. You know, a lot of people are, are that way because they've just been wrecked by sin. Because they've just had the devil just work them over. Life has just worked them over. Yep. You know, they're fainting in the way. And, you know, we should try to have compassion on people. And we do. I mean, that's why we go. At least that's why we should be going. Because we're trying to have compassion on these multitudes. Amen. It says there that they were as sheep. It doesn't say they were sheep. You know, not, not in a, and I don't mean that in a literal sense. I mean, like, because we know that we are of his fold. You know, and that, one, that one day he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. Right? And that the believers are the sheep. When Jesus saw them, he saw them as sheep, being scattered, having no shepherd. And really, that's how we have to see these people. You know, not everybody out there that's unsaved is the son of the devil, is some goat, you know, that just needs to be cast in the lake of fire. Yeah. They're as sheep with no shepherd. And we should desire to bring them into the fold, to bring them in, to give them a shepherd. Yeah. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, for ye were as sheep going astray. There was a time when we didn't know who Christ was. Right. That we were weary, that we were the ones fainting in the way. And somebody had compassion on us right. and preached us the gospel, and we were returned under the shepherd and bishop of our souls. So that's why we do it. That's a great picture of, of evangelism that Jesus gives us there. It says in verse 37, Then he saith unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's always, of course, some very famous verses there. And I like that, you know, often we... We, we think, well, where is everybody? Why, why aren't there more soul winners? Why aren't there more people that are willing to do the work that needs to be done and go out there and reach that? And it's easy to just kind of get down on people or down on other churches that aren't doing it, just kind of get a bad attitude. But what's the answer? What's the solution here that Jesus gives us? He says to pray. You know, I wonder how much we've gotten down on our knees and prayed this prayer that God would send forth more laborers into his harvest. You know, instead of just saying, you know, we're the only ones doing it, and, you know, where is everybody else? How can we just kind of, you can kind of get a bad attitude if you, if you let that uh, take over. It, what we should be doing is praying, you know, and setting the examples. You know, we shouldn't be, you know, asking others to do what we aren't willing to do ourselves. You know, if we're willing to go out there and do the work, then we can kind of say, well, let's pray for more neighbors. Let's ask other people to go out and do this work as well. So that's Matthew chapter 9. Uh, I hope it was a blessing to you. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.